So let's get started on time because you guys are all early. It's amazing. Um, hello and welcome to Gangsters, Lovers, Heroes, Warriors, and Gods, Jack Kirby's Women. You are in the right place. Um, with the Eternals and New Gods movies in development, Jack Kirby is about to get red hot again. Never stop if you ask us, but it's just this will pitch the panel. Um, Jack Kirby, uh, Kirby didn't just co-create much of Marvel, he developed a wide cast of women characters that have stood the test of time. What makes Kirby's women characters, like Big Barra, Jean Grey, and even historical figures, like Ma Barker, so lasting? We'll be looking at what works, what's flawed, and why it's all worth it. With moderator, me. Hi, Elon Eleven. And I'll introduce my panelists for just a moment. Um, introduce my panelists in just a moment. I encourage you guys to live tweet, and if you want to tag us, we can like retweet stuff as you go later. So first off, I want to thank the Jack Kirby Museum for making this all possible. They have a booth here today. Where's your booth from? 970. 970, where you can get awesome Jack Kirby Museum t-shirts. Is this one around there? There is one. There is one. <laughs> there is one of you know, this awesome Jack Kirby Museum t-shirts. They're an amazing resource for learning more about Jack Kirby for doing educational programming, walking tours, and getting access to amazing art that you can check out, find support. So visit the Jack Kirby Museum group. We would not be here without their support. Who the hell am I? Um, Hey, I'm Elon Eleven. Uh, <laughs> my pronouns I use are she or they. Uh, my Twitter handle is E L A N A underscore Brooklyn. I'm the host of the Graphic Policy Radio podcast, um, and uh, I'm a huge Jack Kirby fan, uh, and I always want the opportunity to get to talk about his work. And these panels today are amazing, and you're joining me on this excursion. Okay, also thank you. Adriana Mello like came in and rescued me and was like, yes, I can do this. So thank you. Okay, Adriana is the artist on Female Furies, and she's now working on Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy. And we'll be talking about the Female Furies comic that was obviously taken straight from the pages of Jack Kirby's Fourth World in Manhattan. Cecil Castellucci, writer of Tina Curry. Uh, also now writing on Batgirl. Folks have probably seen Shade the Changing Girl and Plain Jane. Um, and Cecil's handle, everybody, I think everybody's Twitter handle here, so you should be I'm also joined by Heidi McDonald. Thank you, Heidi, for helping make this happen too. Yeah. Thank you, Heidi. <laughs> Of 20 years of experience as an editor of Disney and DC Comics. She edited titles such as The Lion King, Scooby Doo, Swap Things, Why the Last Man. She co hosts Publishers Weekly's graphic novel podcast, More Than Fun. That Jay Justice? It's Jay Justice! <laughs> Jay Justice is a Jamaican American cosplayer, editor, and advocate. Her work has been featured on by Sci Fi, BBC America, and Marvel Comics. And she has been the inspiration for new characters in DC Comics and Blue Studios. Since 2009, she has crafted over a hundred costumes and created panels at conventions around the country on the topics of comics, gaming, diversity in media, and costuming. An outspoken person of color, LGBTQIA plus and disability advocate, Jay is dedicated to creating lasting change in her community and inspiring others to do the same. is Meg Downing. Meg is Rusty Polished on Twitter. Um, Meg is Associate Entertainment Editor at GameSpot, and I've always really enjoyed geeking out with them about like hardcore nerdy Kirby stuff that people don't ever ask us to talk about. And now we'll get to do that. <laughs> so just a brief introduction to Jack Kirby. Folks probably know if you're in the room, but the short version is Jack Kirby born in 1917 on the Lower East Side. The really the, 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 the father of so many of the characters that we watch and love in, in Marvel and we're reading for basically forever today. We wanted to highlight Roz Goldstein Kirby, his wife, who was definitely one of the influences on his <laughs> women in comics, particularly the characters like Big Barda, um, who he's mentioned specifically as her being, being one of the inspirations for that character. Uh, but all these characters are the product of 
a particular artist, a particular creator working in a particular period of time. Um, and understanding them for that particular context is important for looking at his work. Because they didn't, as much as it feels like Jean Grey just created herself, like she actually did it. There was artistic genius behind making that happen. No Jack. Jack also, ooh. Jack also basically invented the genre of romance comics, which um, is not something that I've actually been super familiar with. Uh, and then Cecil and I were just actually chatting. You did a deep dive, deep dive recently. Yeah, I, I just, Let's pass the mics around. I, I read some last night. I wanted to get prepared. Yeah. And, um, you know, and uh, you know, I have a romantic heart, and I always love uh, young romance comics. And so I, I read, I read a bunch last night. Well, like five. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> What's your top line thoughts around like what makes those stories interesting? Well, it, it it seemed to me like the ones that I read, there were like two women who were approaching sort of relationships and men in a completely different way, and there was like kind of an underlying moral in it, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, but, uh, but it's really interesting because obviously it's of the time, and so the, the, um, the women, you know, are dealing with uh, uh, different social situations in different ways, and I think it was interesting because you could kind of see that in the superhero stuff yeah. as well, and um, the way that he had the different women sort of representing different things, and so I thought that was I saw some really clear class politics in one of the issues that I looked at, like this woman's anxiety around whether or not, like she was wealthy enough to keep the to keep the the man who she had gotten to fall in love with her, and like there there's there's stuff in there. Yeah, so and spinsterhood and yeah, you know, like uh, or the fear of being an old maid. And, yeah, 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 the, yeah, the fear of being an old maid. And, ooh. There's a lot. Like this is someone who's definitely been like thinking and working about how like being a low in being a low income woman and like the challenges of trying to break out of like the pink collar jobs. And like aging. It's, and aging. Yeah. yeah, it's in there. So I, I, I wanna do I do want to spend more time on those as well later. But I, I <laughs> when we think about the role that the artist versus the writer plays in comics, one of one of the big things that jumped out at me is um have folks seen the Tumblr Kirby Without Words by Kate Willart. Uh, Kate is, yeah, Kate's amazing. It's all on Tumblr. Um, I, you know, I think when we all think of Jack Kirby, one of the first characters that comes to mind for folks is Jean Grey, because he's one of the co-creators of X-Men we love. And there's this amazing sequence where at the right we see, is it right? Yeah, I got right left issue. At the right we see Jean using her power of telekinesis to free herself and the X-Men. And then if you're reading the captions on the left, you have a scene in which Professor X is telling Jean how to save the X-Men, oh, which feels pretty unnecessary. Like she's, she seems like she's got it all intact. Uh, you know, what, what, do you, what, are folks, what are folks drawn to with Jean as a character? And if you have thoughts on the differences between these two kinds of pages, I'd love to hear it. Well, I just want to point out very quickly that you know, famously, the, the, the crux of the Stan versus Jack right. argument was that Jack would draw it and then Stan would script it. Right. And so, so and I mean, that's the point story. of the Tumblr, is that you know, Stan, uh, wherever Jack was, unfortunately, Stan was so far below him. Absolutely. I mean, there's no question in my mind yeah. that when Jack drew this, it was Jean Grey, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> like, Yeah, and Baker said, like, the character who's not on the panel is somehow the focus of the panel? Yeah. Like, no. She could never have figured that <laughs> No. <laughs> Um, do folks have thoughts around like Jean Grey as a, as, a, as a character from Kirby's work? I know that a lot of folks love Jean. If you want to also just get the mic to whoever feels like speaking on it. Well, I mean, I, um, uh, I'm a classic X-Men fan from, but you know, the, the Claremont reboot and everything. But obviously, you know, Jean, I, I mean, Stan did. He gave the women the, the worst powers. And, you know, I think that's really small. I can, I can listen to Professor X tell me how to do things. And, and, um, I'm invisible, guys! You know, so I so he really didn't, he, you know, he constantly gave them these, these bad powers. And, you know, when the X-Men was rebooted by uh, Claremont and um, the Cockrum, I mean, obviously they, they made you, you know, Phoenix, and we're like, oh, she's been the strongest one all along. Um, <laughs> you know, a character, not to derail the gene talk, but, uh, you know, a character that he didn't put up here, or, you know, didn't mention was the Medusa, right? Yeah, yeah. we have some has, I mean, to me, Yeah, because I mean, he did. He co-created so many amazing characters. Um, you know, I 
think with Medusa, probably the humans, I mean, they're a lot more jacked. I mean, it's pretty obvious uh-huh. that they yeah. were the, the, the dry run for, um, you know, the new gods and um, and the Eternals also. And, you know, I mean, with Medusa, you really got to see much more of a, you know, she was my, you know, she was my favorite. I mean, I wasn't oh. around when these comics first came out, but, you know, uh, uh, you could see she was, uh, she, you know, she had the power of the hair, but mm-hmm. it was very powerful. Yeah, the whole idea of a female hero whose superpower is her hair is a revelation. Um, but speaking of Sue, I, this one just blew my mind as well. We have we have Sue uh, beating up Doctor Doom, and then because uh, Sue knows judo, Jack actually also learned judo at the community center in, in New York. Um, and we have the, the words of uh, Sue telling Doctor Doom that the reason she can beat him up is because. Mr. Fantastic taught her how. And I, what I love though is like, look at these amazing, look, look, being invincible is in some ways, you know, not the most powerful power, but like Jack's showing you kicking her, kicking, she's kicking ass. I don't know, the folks have Sue Su- Storm feelings. It took me a while to get her, and now I'm like become this big Sue Storm evangelist because I think there's so much strength built in there, even if it hasn't always been explored. Well, I don't always love Sue. Oh, I've always loved Sue Storm. Um, I think the biggest, like, run in my collection. I have every single uh, Wade and Ringo um, Fantastic Four run, like all of them. Mm-hmm. And I have a bunch of the omnibuses of the older issues collected. And I've just always been drawn to her as a character because whenever you're the mom, high people always underestimate you, but she was always just as quick as everybody else. And I just, I love that about her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she's sort of the prototypical comics mom. Like, I don't know if there was like a comics mom from the superhero world before that really. Like Wonder Woman is not that. That's not Wonder Woman. <laughs> I just love that, like, you know, I mean, women have felt invisible for a long time, and I love that it's so on the nose like that, you know? and that that's her superpower. I mean, it's like, it's small and large at the same time, you know, um, and uh, yeah, no, I just, I It's a power we all that. share, yeah. being underestimated. Yeah. 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 So I know a character that most of us who are Jack Kirby fans are obsessed with is Big Barda. Um, Jack has spoken that she was influenced, you know, his wife was a big influence on this and like Roz's own personal strength. Uh, and the combination of personal strength and also love that she was expressing, uh, visually also inspired by nightclub singer Lady Kazan, nice big Jewish broad lady as well. Um, I, so Big Barda is one of the characters that Jack just completely created himself because she was from The New Gods, which was the series that he did uh, as his like big, I'm at DC, I'm gonna do what I want, I'm gonna be able to make the art that I wanna make, explosion. The fourth world like, is my, my favorite comics, like period. Uh, we have here in this panel, um, Barda carrying a tank. Her uh, soon to be husband, uh, Scott Free, uh, basically being like, yes Barda, you're amazing. And one of the neighbors saying, Wow, this women's lip thing is getting more serious than I thought. Um, I would love, uh, you know, I know, like, and you also have the panel of, like, Barda professing her love to Scott here. I, I, I don't want to just go on about my Barda feels, but if folks want to share their Barda feels, why the character means so much. You know, she's not petite, she's not a little wisp, like, you know, like someone like Two Storm or, or like mm-hmm. Jean Grey, like you see the, the characters stacked next to each other, they're basically the same body type, like they're functionally the same. Whereas like Barda takes, she commands so much attention just by standing, just by being there. And I think that that's so cool, especially in an era of comics where that didn't happen unless you were a villain and you were a monster and like that was, you know, you got to be big and scary and that wasn't the case. But Barda is this amazing, strong, huge, imposing character who doesn't try to ever make herself small. You never see Barda be like, oh, well, you know, like, this would be better if I could fit in my suit or whatever. Like, you <laughs> never like that. And, like, that's, for me, that's really inspiring. Like, that, that means more to me than seeing someone do something physically cool. Like, that's, you know, like, I don't really care about, like, I'm never going to be able to lift a tank. I'm also probably never going to learn judo. I might. I don't know. <laughs> but, like, that, seeing someone who's so confident and able to just exist as herself without apology at all. I think, um, you know, one of the things that really inspired me um, for Female Furies with Big Barda is that she has the capacity to grow and change. You know, despite just being big, she's also very big inside and in her soul. Um, and the fact that she does 
fall in love with Scott and change her life and change her sort of philosophy on the world and her point of view of the world, I think just shows how big a character she really is. And that's something that to me was very attractive um, about writing her. Adriana. Yes, so you, you got to do like an actual art envisioning, like translating these Jack Kirby iconic characters to female furies into your style. Um, and you know, I'm familiar with your own usual style and like the work you did on female furies is visually, you know, it's a departure. It's sort of like a merging of your style and Jack's style. How did you approach this project? I just wanted to like use the female furies on this panel even though it says he's his picture here. working in the industry, comic books industry for 15 years. This is my favorite book. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it was so fun to work together. It was. <laughs> <laughs> you to do something you get. <laughs> so, um, when I got the, 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 the email and talking about that work and which characters I would working daily for six months. The first thing, of course, always, you, whenever you get an email talking about your job, to get excited, etc. But always, I was excited, but at the same time, I was kind of scared. <laughs> because I was like, oh my god, those are such important characters. And Yeah, I do want to, yeah, like, I think that it's, when I found out that you guys were doing a female furies book and saw that this was clearly, like, a very literal, straightforward take on the systemic abuse of women in the workplace, I was like, I totally see where you could do that from Fourth World, and I'd love to have you guys talk a bit about, like, like, yeah, like, when, you know, you're basing the series on Jack Kirby's Fourth World, and, like, how do you see these themes as something you could bring from them into a new story? Well, you know, the, the project came about from a conversation I had with Dan Tadillo. Like, I was um, sitting there and, um, you know, tr trying to figure out what I was going to do after Shade of Changing Girl, and um, I was pitching this and that and the other thing. He like, oh, Jeff Lemire has that one, and this person has that one, all these boys. And, um, you know, and uh, so then he was talking about them and whatever, and everything that he was saying is, it's like this, it's like that, and they were all, like, boy references. And I was like, ugh, where's your handmaid's tail? And, um, and he was like, oh, that's a really good idea. And then he was like, if you can crack that with the female furies, we can at least have a conversation. And so then, you know, I knew the characters, but I didn't know, you know, um, the fourth world as completely. And so, you know, I was like, well, I'd like to study. And I, I went home with the omnibus and um, studied. And what I was really struck by was how, um, you know, how Granny is one of the most powerful people in the world, but she's given the job of the mother, you know, and, um, you know, sort of woman's work, even though she's very powerful and mighty, and that the female furies are kind of there on the, um, you know, the, like they're very powerful, but they're always like, um, they, they felt like they were on the sidelines. And I was like, oh, this seems kind of familiar. And even though there were a lot of themes that Jack was clearly doing that were very, progressive at the time and very forward thinking, he 
it still was a, a product of when it when it was. Yeah. Um, there was that one panel that you had where uh, Barda is, uh, you know, and the, the the guy says, "Oh, women's lib is." That's actually one of the panels that I looked at. Like I posted, noted, like every single instance that I saw that. And when I hit upon um, the issue of Mr. Miracle number nine, um, and I saw the the story of you, you know the inciting moment that makes Scott and Barda fall in love. Like they're they're meat cute or meat whatever meat fight. <laughs> that like to me I was like oh this this particular issue has everything that I need to to spin the story out and so um, uh, I don't know if that really answered your question but it was yes. just like it was like spinning from what was already there on the page and sort of like pulling open. Between the panels and being like, I'm going to show you the panels that weren't shown, <laughs> you know, um, that were there because it seemed to me that to write a story about the Me Too movement on Apocalypse was, uh, you know, was interesting because how do you how do you deal with hell and hell? Wow. <laughs> I mean, for me, like when we, you know, the New Gods movie is coming and like, yay, a you know, Ava's doing it and like you, your point of like doing Me Too in the fourth world and then Ava being the one. Every different day being the one doing it in the, the, the movie world was like, fourth world is about systems of oppression. And so you have a filmmaker who knows how to talk about systems of oppression and slavery, and she's doing a movie that's about those things. And I think that because the art is so freaking awesome, sometimes people forget that it's also about those painful things. Um, and like your story is like, no, it's also about these systems of oppression. I think that's what something Ava is going to bring to it as well. Do folks have particular hopes and dreams for what you're going to see in the in the New Gods movie that you want to share? Well, I'm just glad that they keep saying that the female furies are going to be Because <laughs> I'm just like, yes! superhero comics I've ever seen, and I remember opening it up and seeing Big Barda, and I was just kind of like, oh, I don't know if this is for me. You know, there was something about it that was intimidating to me, mm. to be honest. And um, so, but then I got into Marvel, and you know, Kirby's work in the 70s, um, I mean, I didn't like, I didn't like his work. You know, it was more of a, I like the art, artistic and all that, that stuff. So, you know, I was like, oh no, Kirby do this, oh. And, uh, you know, we did 2001, which was Space a mind yeah. trip. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Double Dinosaur, which has been, you know, resurrected in this far more interesting and, and, you know, wolf version that really works. Um, and, you know, The Eternals, I mean, reading The Eternals, was like, well, even I, not as a Kirby fan, was like, whoa, what is going on here? Um, and, you know, meeting Jack, I mean, he was, you know, he was aware he was a genius. I want to say that. And he did not tire of telling you, but he was such a genius <laughs> that you could not help but, you know, worship him. And, you know, and then I became to understand through through the admiration that people had for him and that, you know, he invented, uh, well, you know, superheroes, practically with Captain America, and worked with Joe Simon, you know, and then they invented romance comics, and they invented kid sidekicks, and then they did Marvel, you know, and he did Marvel, and then he did this other stuff. I mean, it was insane to be that creative for that long, right? Uh, and I began to understand just what a visionary he was, and, you know, the really privilege to, to know him. And, you know, uh, I guarantee you, like, if you get comic book artists of a, you know, certain generation together, you know, Kirby will come up, and I'll oh, probably love him. Uh, but I never had women talk about his work like this. And to me, that's just so gratifying. Yeah. And, you know, Elena told me about the idea for this panel, and I was just like, yes. And, you know, I, I, I mean, I'll tell this story just because mm -hmm. it's like, so they had initially not approved this panel. It was on the waiting list. And I had this other panel that I put in approved. And I wrote, and I said, look, I want to swap this out. <laughs> I said, this women talking about Kirby panel is something that's never been done before. And, and it's going to, like, you know, I'm so excited to bring it full circle. You know, the uh, Eternals, absolutely, you know, is in production. You know, the New Gods movie, well, we'll see. Things that Warner Brothers aren't quite as, you know, anything can happen. Um, but, you know, to see these really, um, like, visionary, 
crazy worlds of Jack Kirby brought to screen by <coughs> women, by women directors, by women visionaries. It's just so extraordinary. And I do know Jack, he would have loved it. I mean, he might have had some like, oh, these women lovers are making movies now. <laughs> um, but I, I do know, I think, uh, I think he would really have been, he was not afraid of strong women, that's mm -hmm. obvious. Yeah. He was not, he was not intimidated by it, he didn't fear them, and, and he uh, honored them and respected them, and um, you know, I think, I think he would have thought it was so cool, because he really tried to, in his work, uh, you know, it was about heroism, and it was about human, you know, the potential of the human, and yeah. I, I always oh, felt like when uh, I was writing Well, it, I, I mean, can't really tell you my cast for it. When I was working on Female Furious, I, I had this distinct impression that Jack would have, I would have loved to have had a beer with him. To like, because I'm sure we would have argued about some things, but I think it would have been a really great conversation and we both would have like come away with it. And I think that's what I respected so much about the way that he wrote women. Um, was that 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 I felt like we could we could talk about stuff, you know? And I think that's really that's like an honor to his legacy as well. That there's so much there to be discussed, and it's not just the women stuff. I mean, the way that he talks about sort of like you know nature versus nurture, and like you know like all of the you know sort of like uh, you know stuff in the Eternals with like you know the, the 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 three different types and the DNA and the experiments and you know even in the fourth world, and it's you know he's he's really deep thinking about a lot of things, um, you know, and, um, and so I think, I think uh, it, it you know, brought a lot to the table. Well, you know, I know that a lot of times when, like, mo modern readers, especially, like, you know, people who are, like, not, like, say, white men, are directed to new comics, they sort of focus us on, like, talking about contemporary work, the assumption being that older work that's by white men is stuff that we're not going to, like, care about or relate to. And, you know, certainly, like, there are moments when you're reading, especially, like, Silver Age or Golden Age comic, where you see a page and you're like, well, that was sexist. But you make a decision, like, is this good enough that I'm gonna keep reading anyway? Like, what, am I gonna get enough out of it? Um, I mean, for me, one of the reasons why I always can keep reading Jack is because, like, I can tell he's trying. Like, even if, right, like, even if something's a little bit sexist, I'm like, he's trying. Um, but that might not be enough for everybody. So, I mean, did folks have, like, an initial reaction to some of the stuff that might not pass your current contemporary feminist muster? Was that like a problem? Were you just like, eh, it's of this time? Or like, how do you relate to that? Was it like, was the barrier, or, you know? So go for it, I feel like there's a big difference between something that is like, oh, what's a non-ableist way to say this? Uh, so there's some work that is harmfully uh, prejudiced or harmfully like uh, t tasteless or like, a, that causes people to like, get them, it just kind of encourages negative behavior. And then there's work that, okay, this is clearly written in a time where this is appropriate, but you can still enjoy the artwork and the story and the, the, the world building in it without necessarily taking the perspective that you're getting from this one character in this book. But then you're also, I've never read anything about Jack Kirby that didn't have another perspective, as well as the villainous one. It wasn't just everything negative and everything derogatory. There were different perspectives in the same narrative that you were getting, so you were getting a more of a full picture. Mm -hmm. If what you're reading is just very monotone, it's gonna be a bad book anyway, as well as also feel like it's too sexist or something for you to really enjoy it. But that's not a problem that I've encountered anymore. So. Yeah, exactly. that 
understand the the lineage, I guess, and like the lineage of these comics, which also made it easier, more palatable. Whenever there was a moment of like, oh, that's kind of you know a little dicey, or that's not something that I would really you know want to. Just kind of pick something just to pop in my head. Yeah, um, I think that the way you're introduced to comics really shapes how you view older comics. Right. Like the first comic book I ever read, I was four years old, and it was Punisher War Journal. <laughs> <laughs> my mom was like, "What is this garbage?" Like, no, it's good. <laughs> so I feel like just being completely enchanted with the idea of being able to read a book this way that wasn't the Bible because it's very strict household book. So, but from the Bible, the Punisher War Journal. Um, so that that made me want to read anything that had that kind of like storytelling. So the the whole idea of, of the medium is what drew me to it. So I didn't care how old the book was, I was gonna give it a chance. Sure. So I feel like if you got into comic books after having read lots of other stuff and like having developed a palette already, you kind of pull away from things that seem unfamiliar. Right. So it definitely, I mean, I didn't think about before that, oh, that would be why someone would have a harder time getting into older comics if they're looking for something that reminds them of manga or something else that they've been yeah, doing. Exactly. I mean, that's, and that's really what I was like, you know, like I started reading manga when I was 10. I started reading comics when I could drive to the comic book. Um, and like that was my access to it. And I, the first book I really picked up, I was like, and I came into the store because my friend's sister had told me about Jason Todd. And I was like, cool, I want to read Under the Hood. And the guy at the counter told me that I shouldn't read that book because it was bad. And I was like, oh, well then. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and so and I was like 15. And, you know, like that, I was at a crossroads at that point, And I was like, I could set it, you know, I'd just be like, okay, buddy, and leave. Or I could double down. And I doubled down super hard. And so that's, you know, and, but like that was the book that got me into things, like into American comics. And so it took a while for me to understand silver and gold and stuff. Mm. Like I just did not get it until I got it. Like it was a quick moment. Right. It was like, definitely like a light switch moment. I was like, oh. And then the history of it kind of unfolded in front of me. And that was, I, that's, you know, when you come at it, like, like when you're reading history, mm -hmm. that's, that like, it makes it so much easier to appreciate. And it's so much more fun. So, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Go you ahead. You know, I'm curious. I, I, I mean, it's, it is once you learn about comics, you like, like you know, you learn just that Kirby inspired like ev everything that's happened in superhero world. Everything in the superhero world is is in some way inspired by Jack Kirby. Um, and then you learn how important he is. But I, I'm, <laughs> but I'm wondering, Adriana, like, but where did where are you from? I'm from Brazil. I, I was going to say Brazil, but yeah. I didn't want to. Um, so I mean, was, what, were you aware of his work at all as a young artist at all? Or no, 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 not at all. I began, you know, um, now even in Brazil we have a lot of um, comic book uh, schools, so you can go there and learn about anatomy, storytelling, etc. But when I began to read comic, and here's the thing. Um, I'm a kid from the 80s, 90s, so I grew up hearing that comic books, the superhero comic books, was for boys. Mm -hmm. So I never read Superman, Batman, etc. because in my head, oh, this is for boys. I don't like that. I don't want to read that. So my first comic book, when I, I was 16. Mm -hmm. So now, this is something I think all the time. I, I think, oh gosh, what if I had grown up more since my childhood reading comic books? Probably to, I would, you know, begin thinking about, okay, that's what I want to be for women way earlier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, I remember something. I was at school, eight, nine, ten years old, and I remember seeing a boy reading a comic book. It was the made was Superman crying, Supergirl in his arms. Oh. And I was, oh my God, <laughs> this is so violent. Let's <laughs> make this for boys. <laughs> My art teacher at the time said, okay, um, the, for tomorrow, I want each and every one of you to go and buy a comic book of any superhero you want. And your assignment would be choose a page, choose, choose any page, and copy the page. And I was like, oh gosh, you're going to read comic 
box from one of our heroes. What is that? And that's the thing. When I bought the first one, when I read it, I, I thought to myself, this is fun. This is super fun. <laughs> Why people said that I shouldn't wear that because I'm a girl? Yeah. yeah. And I begin reading, um, at the time was the death of the Superman, and then I thought, oh, this is, this is cool, and then we used to, oh, actually we still have that in Brazil. We have a comic book museum, comic book, actually not a museum, a library. So you can go there and read any book from the last 30 years. <laughs> And I thought, okay, I have 16 years to get back. <laughs> and I spent, I went to high school in the morning, afternoon, library, comic book library. And I read everything, Silver Age, Golden, everything that was in there. I used to big, big stacks of comic books, go to a, a couch and go, <laughs> and actually I was waiting for we have it moved back again because that was something I wanted to tell folks that uh, I know this is um, we were looking for page that is like what but every scene everything you see on Kirby's work all the phases of storytelling, um, layouts, camera angles, we use now. We mm -hmm. can still use the way he creates to tell stories. That's how, not just, he's, it's not just storytelling. It's a way to portray the characters, it's a way to bring you to the story that is so good that in, when I was doing that page, yeah. <laughs> actually, <laughs> when I was doing that page, that is a flashback, and the idea with the editor and everyone was every time we have a flashback scene, we want to have this curve feeling to the page and the panels. So I went there and I studied Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, Granny Goodness is older when we see her in the fourth world. And you're doing a flashback story. Um, so you got to create what Granny Goodness looked like as a younger woman. Um, and also acted like, and like what her, basically like her career as an evil person in Apocalypse. Um, you know, her evil career. So uh, I would love for you guys, for Cecil and for, for Edgar and Diana, to sort of reflect on coming up with the young, young Granny Goodness. First things that I did when we first started working was remember I made a Pinterest. Oh yeah. For us. So um, I made a Pinterest board uh, for each uh, for each Fury and for Apocalypse. Um, just uh, because I wasn't even sure whether or not we were going to be like reinventing what the Furies looked like. Like at the very beginning, it was very open. Like, but then we decided we would just go classic, you know, classic characters um, and stuff. But um, I, there were a lot of old ladies in the in the uh, in the that that sort of helped us to sort of like sort of figure out what she, sh she should be chic and cool and beautiful because mm -hmm. I kind of felt like she was, you know, a beautiful woman. A very strong, yeah. very, um, yeah, beautiful, chic, yeah. etc. But at the same time, I always thought she needs to look, you know, fierce yes. yeah. and, and people should be scared of her. Yeah. Just by looking at her. Yeah. Even if she's yeah. younger yeah. and everything. I mean, like, can't you see, like, Wendell and Christy playing her or something? Like, yeah. Yeah. Or something? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, I know Meg and I were talking briefly about, like, Granny Goodness, about how she's terrifying. Um, I, 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 when I was putting together this panel, I just looked at this page where I, I love this reveal. She's at her 
desk working on over you know working with Overlord and her little computer of evil and she's wearing this like house dress in this robe and she's like this grandma and then when she gets up to throw down she's like yeah I'm not actually Aunt May I'm um, wearing this warrior's outfit um, and like I might be a grandma age but I'm actually going to kick your ass um, Meg you had some thoughts about creating goodness I wanted to make sure you hit up oh no I guess creating goodness is the only super villain in comics that actually scares me like everybody else I, yeah, no, I'm so attracted to her. Don't do that. <laughs> um, no, this like, was very confusing for us in some ways. <laughs> um, no, like, there's something so deeply sinister about her that's simultaneously, like, fantastically evil, but also incredibly grounded. Um, like, I, I, had a, I had a bad relationship with my own grandmother, and um, I can see a lot of, like, you can transpose a lot of her, you know, like, more mundane dialogue, but not about, you know, her and whatnot, like the way that she conducts herself and the way that she manipulates Barda specifically, like the fact that it's like, oh, well, Granny loves you, but you know she's going to show that love by torturing you and you know making you stronger. And that's there, there's something about that because I mean, you see that relationship, that sort of gaslighting relationship between a lot of like men and their male mentors, right? You don't ever really see it that in like a maternal context in this way, unless it's. tried to think of with Granny um, moving from, you know, establishing her from when she was younger to when we see her later, is what she had to do in order to survive and keep her power. And I think that's what makes her so scary. Because she, like, in a way, by having the female furies, it's like she was one, and then there were her furies, and then, like, so my idea was that it was like she was one, then she had her furies, and then they are able to finally sort of like see, make a break and have a new world. And, but what, she, what, at what cost it came to her? I mean, like, that's why I think she looks the way that she looks is because, is because it, it's like she's, everything that she's lived is on her face. And that's what I love about Granny. She's I think really she's super yeah. complex. She's like the only woman in like Dark Side's power elite, really. Like, She's totally as equal, and he yeah. keeps. I think he keeps her close because he knows that she could really, she could, she could really take the power. You know. Well, one thing I want to take a moment to go to is there's some interesting contrast with like Jack's handling of like superhero women and Jack's handling of like non super powered women. Um, I was struck by this issue of Thor, which is basically one where this is definitely a Stan and Jack thing together. I think decide that they like are done with Jane Foster. They like literally shunt her off to San Francisco because she can't handle the intensity of being a god. And then he meets and has a meet cute with Sith and they're like immediately like, oh you're a badass, I love you. Um, <laughs> and I just kept thinking like looking at that and I was looking at the Eternals, like there's definitely some differences in how Jack handles mundane women versus like super powered women. Although there are a few mundane women who I think do come off well. Do you folks want to reflect a bit on that as well? Yeah, go for it. I think, I mean, I think Jay was talking a little bit earlier about how there's always different perspectives in, in Kirby's work, and I think that that, you see the brunt of that in the very stark delineation between the superhero and the civilian, and we see that really specifically with the women who, I think a lot of times, Jack would use the non superpower women as sort of the audience stand-in yeah. for a lot, yeah, totally. for a lot of, which is an interesting choice in and of itself, right? It's considering that for a lot of the, the audience for these books were young boys. Um, but the audience stand-in was a lot of times, the, you know, it was Jane Foster, it was, I forget, I forget the civilian. Margaret Damian and, yeah. and like, the Eternals. Yeah. Yeah. She's constantly like, this is really overwhelming. Right, and it's, it's always overwhelming. <laughs> and, and she's not wrong. Right, and it's, you know, someone who's got to be there to ask the questions to then earn the exposition, which right. is not, you know, that's not always the best choice, but I think, in and in of itself, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I wish he would have kind of diversified his uh, audience conduit sometimes. Um, but I think, really, I think that that's kind of the core of it. I think like a story. My favorite Jack Kirby Monday woman is absolutely Alicia Masters. She's a working artist in like New York in like the 1960s who's getting her own gallery shows and like that was itself completely rare, and her art style is actually not even popular at all then, so she's just beyond. <laughs> she's just like breaking all the molds. Do folks have favorite like mundane 
uh, or, or obscure Jack Kirby ladies. I stole yours. Do well, you want to talk about her? Like, talk about her, please. Also, the Carter. Peggy Carter. Yeah. Peggy Carter. Yeah. I mean, like, you have to understand, like, Kirby's Peggy Carter is not the Peggy Carter we really see on in the MCU. But I think it's still, like, the concept of the character is very cool. Like, the, like the super spy version of, of Peggy Carter. I mean, I guess she's not technically a civilian. She's even a shield agent. But, but she has no powers. Yeah. She doesn't have any powers. But, like, I think that she, for the most part, she came off pretty well until other men started writing her. And then hmm. it kind of I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't know. We had in Shield, right? We had Valentina. Mm. That was a. But she wasn't normal either. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. You know, he was really obsessed with the, the super, the superhuman. I mean, that was his field of study. I think he, uh, he 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 saw all of us turning into superheroes at some point or not. So, um, yeah, it was hard to find him obsessed with my name. That's probably why they were his, like, viewpoint characters. Right, yeah. Let's talk about the Eternals for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, like, the New Gods is, like, my favorite. And Eternals, I quite enjoyed, but, like, the New Gods, even though they came earlier, you know, were, like, and this is the fourth one, which is absolutely my favorite. But folks are definitely getting more geared up to talk about New Gods in the new movie. Um, I think, like, you know, there's basically three major women characters in the Eternals. You've got Fena, who's basically Athena. You got Cersei, who's like, this is even Game of Thrones, but Cersei from the myths, she like literally turns sailors into pigs and is living her best life in a Manhattan with posh blonde doing art. It's really beautiful. And, and Margot Damien, who's the mundane character who's just dealing with a lot. I mean, you know, when I first read this, I was like, Margot, stop complaining. And then I was like, she's right there. This is overwhelming. That would be how you would feel about all of the things that just happened. Uh, do folks have particular hopes or dreams or things you're excited about for the Eternals coming out? to do it because I mean it was so trippy and I mean it is you do see you see Jack's work I mean it just went like farther and farther and farther out in but I you know Eternals is just like so spectacular I mean like I said when I when I saw that I was just like well I can't really follow the story you know I'm a kid but I don't get where this is going but wow this is amazing you know and, and wait there's celestials too I mean you know he just was like oh gods upon gods upon gods it was like every god has a bigger god so yeah, I don't like like um, you know I'm I'm sitting here looking at Meg's tattoo and you have a little Kirby crackle there, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's so cool. Of, yeah, she's got cool. some Kirby crackle cool. tattoos. I'm so I'm full of Kirby crackle. Yeah, <laughs> like, like I mean you know the fact that his artwork is successfully transferred to tattoos, um, you know bringing it to the screen is is I, I hope they can do it. Like it's just so mind boggling. Well, and they, they did pull off Doctor Strange. I mean that's it though. They, yeah, they made a movie with a tree, a raccoon <laughs> holding a huge gun, yeah. and it worked. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. So I, 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 anything I, possible. I, I, you know, it's interesting, Heidi, because like when I was reading, so I read the, Etern the book one of the Eternals yesterday, and like as soon as I started reading it, what I loved about it was I was like, oh, how would I tell this story? Like, what would I pluck out of this story? And so I, I could see a couple of way, different ways that they could go. I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing.